was higher than other places, other spots. But cities and states don't just depend on agricultural resources. As I told you yesterday, and as I hope we'll see today, there are many things. And here we define a city and a state as almost the same thing. But size, I think, is not enough. And I don't think there's much new in them. But I think that it's well to keep these points in mind when looking at the archaeological records from Sousa and Anshan, about 500 kilometers apart. In particular, I think we want to look at some of the determinatives of the determinants of urban growth, such as the increase in food supply and population, craft specialization, marketing and trade, landlords, administration, defense, religion, all of those things are the kinds of things we want to think about when we look at early urban formations in this area. Archaeologically, we can sometimes see city walls, sometimes see gates, urban quarters, things like that that reflect the foundations and growth of early city-states and early cities. Here's the air view of Sousa. And I'd like to point out, first of all, that the site of Sousa has different parts to it that were named early on by the French excavators. The Acropolis, the highest point of the site, which you see is measured around seven hectares, is one of the longest sequences of religious buildings that we have. You also see the Apadana, the place of the Achaemenid Palace, about 6.3 hectares. Those two areas seem to have been occupied around 4000 BC when Susa became the center of Susiana. Whether or not it was a city, I, I would not think it was, but some people have suggested that it was because of the importance of the platform that was discovered on the Apadana. This area that's marked in green here, called the Haute Terrasse, was first excavated early on by Jacques de Morgan in a large trench. And he was very, he, he wanted to reach the origins of civilization. And he was very disappointed when he reached virgin soil and found a large cemetery with skele many skeletons and beautiful pottery and some metal objects. And he realized he was far from early civilization. In excavating that large trench, however, he revealed, he was he outlines of a huge platform. And subsequent work in the 1970s revealed that this platform was the basis for a number of larger structures not really well preserved. What you see here is the line of de Morgan's trench, and here you see the line of the platform as outlined in the 70s. And here you see some upper structures, again, not well preserved. And over here is the cemetery area. And that cemetery area contained many, maybe even thousands of graves, we're not sure. But what we are sh more sure of is that there was the first stage of the terrace, that it was founded here, as you see, at a time that dates to about 4000 BC. We're also quite clear on the fact that it collapsed. And here you can see the collapsed strata. And you can maybe make out here some of the skeletons that were found in this collapsed strata. 
I'm sure some of you are familiar with this reconstruction that's found in the National Museum in Tehran, a um, little bit far flung. Uh, I, I wouldn't exactly know that there was a market for pots, but it's kind of nice to see it. And here's one of these burials. And I want to point out that this is the only one of these burials that was ever drawn. So we don't have much information, but you can see here a kind of metal blade and pottery and some beads. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. So is the big platform and the construction of that platform as well as a relatively large concentration of the population at that time, is that enough to make a city? And we have to look then outside Susa itself and see if the hinterlands are the support of that city. And so far we have ambiguous, I would say, data. Maybe uh, since my work is quite old and out of date, maybe some new data has appeared that I don't know about. But so far I think that data is somewhat ambiguous and that if we look at the settlement patterns, we have a two level settlement hierarchy and Sousa is certainly the center. And it seems perhaps that people brought their dead to be buried in and around that platform in the Sousa one period, foundational period of Sousa. The next excavation I want to talk about is the Acropolis excavation of Alain Lebrun and these are all from his excavation and here you see the section that he created along the edge of this piece of pillar of earth that was left as a kind of witness to the amount of dirt removed in the early excavations. What he found there was a parallel sequence to the platform. Basically in the lower levels, Sousa one, and where you see the extensive pitting here, this go correlates with the collapse strata and then Sousa two. And here we see a kind of transitional strata between Sousa two and Sousa III, which we um, can date by the tablets found in it uh, to Proto-Elamite or early Proto-Elamite. So here's his chronology, virgin soil, pottery, painted pottery, uh, beveled rim bowls. And then the most interesting thing from the point of view of urbanization are the discovery of tablets first with numbers and various other types of administrative artifacts along with tablets that have a few signs. And these tablets are followed after a short break by tablets that we call proto-elamite. And I know that you're going to have a, a talk on these, so I won't say anything further except to suggest that here we have an indication of a formalized administration system. And it seems as though this formalized administration system requir was required since the population now must have been somewhat bigger. How much bigger, we don't know, but it's clear that it was indeed um, somewhat less, somewhat more formal than the earlier Sousa I administration. Here's Sabi's clay bulla from Acropole 18, showing the development of these administrative systems. In Sousa I, we have only stamp seals. We have a figure on one that's, that's maybe some kind of chief or shaman or ruler but we don't have the complexity that we have in the Sousa II period. And here's this chart from Lebrun, which shows the various phases, level 18 at top, level 17, and then level 16 with proto-Elamite. Is Sousa II a city? Is it urban? 
it's again difficult to say because we don't have actual urban quarters excavated nor do we have a city wall. But what we do have is some indication of a ruler, sometimes called the priest king. And we also have an indication of religious formal buildings that you see here in the center of the seal impression. Likewise, as I said, we have to look to the countryside and the countryside also seems to suggest that in the middle Susa II period, which was closely connected to the Uruk period in Mesopotamia, that we do have the growth of settlements around. We have a growth of specialization, in particular of ceramic production locally that was exchanged. So we start to see the background, the outside of the city, and the center of Susa as being supported by that city. Here are some of these Proto-Elamite tablets and I'll just mention a few items here. One is that these tablets, as well as the tablets found in Anshan, are part of a larger uh, phenomenon that we see in Iran that's connected, I believe, with, the, with early urban developments, especially in Anshan, but also in Susa. This is just to show you how these tablets should be shown and to remind you that the stylistic features of these tablets are very distinct. And in particular, the tablets show a kind of accounting system for large amounts of various commodities, indicating that the population was large. So that there are large numbers of sheep, large numbers of small cattle, things like that. And the problem for us archeologically is that outside Susa, we have been unable to identify a large number of supporting sites. What we can say is that the Proto-Elamite period, the city expanded to the south and likely included the 12, 15 hectares of the Acropole and Apadana and maybe part of the Ville Royale in this area. I put this slide in to show the area of the terrace over here the area of Acropole II, and to remind you that the city's whole configuration was changed by the Achaemenids, and that the city wall of the Achaemenid period was actually cut into deposits of the third millennium BCE. So in that trench that you were looking at, and we'll look at again, we have layers from the Proto-Elamite up through the dynasty of Shimashki. And around 2100 BC, here you can see this layer at the very base, and you can see this large trench. This is about 3000 BC, this is about 2000 BC. And all of this is dump. Early French excavators dumped the fill of their trenches back onto the site, making excavation somewhat difficult. One thing I learned recently is that some of the cracks that you see here in that trench may be due to earthquakes. The other thing that we see here is a quite open plan, at least in a little area, of housing, residential types buildings with hars and pits and various kinds of drains. So I think that we can suggest that Susa likely becomes a city along with the Uruk cities, whether or not this was by conquest or whether it was by um, absorption 
We're not quite sure, but it does grow and it is supported by its hinterlands. We have a number of indications then of urban growth, in particular, the advent of a complex administrative system in Susiana that develops between 18 and 17, and then in 16 takes off on its own. This sequence shows you the sequence from the trench that you looked at. And I just want to mention that twice in this time period, Susa comes under Mesopotamian control, once under the Akkadian dynasty, and then again under the Ur III dynasty. It's controlled to a certain extent, likely by local folk. Is it a city? Yes, I think it's a city, although it's perhaps a small city and an outpost of settlement, not a large city with big city walls, but it's difficult to say because of the lack of excavated information. One thing we can say is that during this period of the third millennium, especially the late third millennium, we have another site called Cholapan, which was exceedingly important that's unexcavated. And we still don't have a great deal of material from, from the region around. Roma Guzman excavated for many years in the Ville Royale. And in particular in Ville Royale A, he focused on the second millennium BCE. And here he went down a meter every year until he reached level A15 and reached virgin soil. Then he moved over to this area, Ville Royale B, and he excavated a small area there and found second millennium BC material, but very early in the second millennium BC and continuing the sequence from Ville Royale A. Unfortunately, those excavations were very small, although we do have some tablets that show the period when Susa was under uh, control of the Ur III dynasty. And we have some slightly later material that overlaps with the Suhalma phase of the Ville Royale A. So Susa itself is expanding, especially around 1900 after the collapse of the Ur III dynasty under the dynasty of the Suhalma. And it grows, we think, to around 50 hectares, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. We don't really know where uh, Sousa, Sousa's city wall at this time was. But what we can say is that, especially around 1900 to 1800 BC, in over a hectare excavated in the Ville Royale, we have a dense kind of urban look to the settlements. This is a, a photo that I took many years ago when they had excavated the very lowest level of A15, Ville Royale A15, and left it open. And what I'd like to point out here is that there's crossroads alleyways urban housing and that in the subsequent upper levels 14 and 13 this changes and those smaller houses are replaced by larger much larger as you see here and over here much larger houses much larger housing and in a 13 there's even a, a kind of period of abandonment, but a whole series of ceramic kilns. In A12 and A11, which are not well known, especially A11, we have the construction of a large building here, and we see a kind of wall here, but we don't know what it's, what it's about. We don't know what it goes with, unfortunately. We also see here 
a large number of burials that disturbed the, uh, the layers, in particular Ville Royale 12. And here you see some of the arrows pointing to where those burials are, were found. So if we look at these houses, we see a kind of, of regularized plan of construction that consists of the central courtyard and a reception room with four niches, two on each end, suggesting perhaps a vaulted kind of, of reception room around and other rooms around an open courtyard. And of course, people working in Shush looked down to Shush and saw this is a type of plan and kind of, of related it to what they saw in Shush back in the 1970s. So is Susa a city? Yes, I think it's definitely a city. During this time, both of the Sukoma and Shimashki, and I believe that the analysis of the settlement patterns shows that there was a rich exploitation of the, the Susiana Plain at the time, and that there were close connections to the site again of Chalkapan. Towards the middle of the millennium, however, we start to see some changes. And those changes involve the construction and expansion of new settlements that challenged Sousa's position. We don't know much about Sousa after the end, after about 16, 1500, in terms of modern excavation. We have mostly only finds from the older excavations. Recent work at Kabnak, modern Haftepe, however, shows that beginning at least in the Sukoma phase, this town starts to grow and starts to rival Sousa's position even as a center of royal settlement. And of course, you know of Al Untash Napirisha, the city of Napirisha. So what I would suggest is that perhaps towards the middle of the millennium and even a little bit later, we start to see what we see perhaps in Kassite Mesopotamia. The construction of new towns and the attempt to dilute the power of the old time central place of Susa by the focus on these two new cities, Kabnak and Al Untash Napirisha. So what we have, as I said, we know that Susa was still important. We have a number of temples and bits of temples. If they were in baked brick or, or sometimes in glazed brick, they were discovered. And so we know that the Acropole was of importance. We think that the town was also relatively well occupied during these periods, but the actual evidence is difficult to come by. Again, we could point to this side of this slide where we have some idea from the Assyrian reliefs of city wall and perhaps a, a central kind of platform with horns on it. But we don't really know much about the layout of the town at this time. We also have this wonderful bronze model, which shows us two sort of tower-like structures and is perhaps a, an indication of what kind of buildings might have been on the Acropolis during the Middle Elamite period. And this molded brick facade shows us that the temples were decorated in certain ways, certain fashions, and in particular in this one is reminiscent of Kassite period Mesopotamia. However, we have Elamite inscribed bricks that decorated and describe it and give us an idea that the exterior sanctuary that was dedicated with protective beings and that there was an interior sanctuary that contained chapel with statues of the royal family. So some have said that Susa and Anshan are 
their growth can be explained by trade and exchange. This map put together by my former student, Joseph Lerner, shows the resources that were exploited on the Iranian plateau and their location in relationship to Susa and Anshan. Gold, copper, tin, far away, various kinds of other minerals. But you'll notice that Susa is really quite distant. And if we think about Susa's location, for trade, it's not the ideal place. Anshan is closer, and Anshan also likely had some outlet to the Persian Gulf. So it's possible that trade and exchange played a role here, but I have never been sure about Susa and its large role, if, if it played a large role in that trade and exchange. So here's Anshan with a little star on it. And the important thing is to note the, the difference in the shoreline of the Persian Gulf and the fact that Anshan is halfway, more or less halfway between the Konar Sandal sites of the Giroft area and the Mesopotamian sites of Susiana. In, the, in Anshan, the late Banesh or Proto-Elamite period is a period of urban growth. There's no question about that. But somewhat later, we have limited occupation until we reach the middle Kaftari period. Again, a very similar pattern to what we see, what we see in Susa. Anshan was identified by the discovery of inscribed baked bricks of Hute Ludish in Shushinak that record the construction and dedication of the temple at Anshan. Now, subsequent excavations revealed some economic tablets that place of transaction recorded at Anshan. Because of the size and importance of the site, it's assumed that Anshan Telimalyan, modern Telimalyan, was already the center of settlement and maybe already Anshan in the third and late fourth millennium. Here you see a plan and we do have a city wall and that city wall through excavations in BY8 and several smaller tests as well as investigation in some Ganat holes looks to be founded in the late Banesh or middle to late Banesh period. We also have excavations at ABC here and TUV that provide data for the Banesh period. This is the ABC operation. Down here at the very bottom was a sounding made to Neolithic levels but no Bakun material so far, except for a few sur surface shirts. So the first real foundational Banesh layers in level five, or those that have been excavated in this particular section, I should say, already show a kind of link to Susiana. And those links include the size of bricks, include the introduction of various kinds of administrative artifacts and show in this case in level two, the construction of a public building with huge storage vessels in a row here. Perhaps the most obvious of the planned and likely public structures was found in level three which had these very square rooms and hars and wall paintings. Here are some of these tablets and administrative artifacts, and you can see here level three and level two. Here you can see this is a statuette from the Brooklyn Museum, but we talked about this particular style of animals and human positions. As I'm sure you all know, uh, 
these tablets and these types of seals and seals and their use are widespread in Iran, not just for Anshan, but also in areas in the central plateau in Tepeyaya. And there's even, I believe, a couple of tablets as far east as Shara So it is an indication of a large scale uh, system that is linking various areas of the Iranian plateau together or tying them together, at least in a cultural fashion. This is the TUV area and where ABC seems to have public buildings, TUV seems to have more private types of structures, although there were many, many tablets. So it's difficult to know just exactly what the role of this particular TUV operation, what this t the TUV buildings were, but they seem to be relatively ordinary houses where some production took place of beads, metal, things like that. We have a large number of seal impressions. And again, these seal impressions, this glazed steatite style is again, one of those widespread type of artifacts. Just what the how the distribution of artifacts and of particular styles relate to political structure is a question that I can't answer for you, but I can point out. So ABC and TUV, they are both areas where we have proto-Elamite along with BY8 over here, and along with several soundings here, as well as investigations in these ganats here that go over the city wall. Do I think Anshan is a city? Yes, I think Anshan is a city at this time. And I think it's quite likely that it was the center of settlement for the region around the Kur River Basin. The early Sukhoma period is a period of growth, as we said, in Khuzestan. And what I'd like to point out here is that Malian produced six brick fragments, none found in situ, but one of them have parts, one or two of them have parts of the Sukhoma titulary, including Sukal of Elam and Shimashki and sister's son of Silhaha. One of them belongs to Siwe Palar Hupak, and that one suggests that there was a temple in Anshan. Would that we could find that, but we haven't found it. Here you see the area of the sea that we looked at, and you notice that perhaps it, the Banash layers were sealed by trash layers, and there were lots of wells dug in, and that trash dates primarily to the Sukalma or Kaftari period. And you see here these little dashed lines, an indication of a likely roadway between GHI, which is the sounding that focused on the Sukhoma area. So we have an idea that the city from survey is completely occupied during this time and that the city wall, which had been abandoned more or less at the end of the Banesh period, is refurbished and rebuilt. We also have an indication here, as you can see in this slide, of an important kind of building in this period found in level three. So is there anything between the Proto-Elamite and the early second millennium BCE? The answer to that is likely there is, but not visible to us on the surface of the site. The upper figure shows a sounding pottery from a sounding next to the GHI H5, 
which found pottery that can be compared to Godin 3.6. And you see the parallels there. And there's also a, another sounding H1 carried out by John Alden and Kamyar Abdi that show us a Banesh Kaftari transitional phase. Was there a city here at that time? I don't think we can answer that, that question yet. It's a large site and it may well be that there is clear occupation in the late third and early, very early second millennium. What we know of the Kaftari period, sorry, that skipped. What we know of the Kaftari period is, from survey is clear. William Sumner identified a four level settlement hierarchy that you see outlined on this map centered around Telimalyan which was by far the largest of the settlements in the region. Around 1600, however, those settlements that we have I've been able to identify become fewer and the population of Anshan Telimalyan seems to be reduced from say 20,000, maybe down to 4,000 people. We only know of this Kale period in the kiln at BB 33, as well as in the upper, very upper level of the GHI sounding. So we're very much in the dark about whether Anshan was a city during the period from say 1600 to 1300. What we can say is that somewhere around 1300 or 1200, that the city again shows close relationships to Mesopotamia and to, of course, Susa. And that's when we get the construction of this large monumental building that I excavated many years ago. And we think its foundation date is somewhere around 1200, maybe 1250, and it's abandoned around 1000 after a large fire that destroyed it. Here you can see a plan, level four is in blue. And just want to point out that after this building was abandoned, we can see that there was a, a phase where the edge of it was used as kilns and then a small little construction here. Now this yellow reuses some of the walls of the major building and is not far distant in time from them. After the, so here are some of the materials and we have these middle Elamite goblets. We have various kinds of painted wares, Kale painted wares, especially used likely from the kiln, debris from the kiln as filling between the floors of the earliest foundation of the level four and the burnt level. For between 4B and 4A. We also have a few shirts of shoga wear. Here's one, and none of Tamuran wear. And I'll come back to those in a minute. Here you see some of the administrative texts that were found in small, medium, and large. And Matthew Stoper, who's published these texts, has pointed out that the large text that you see, number 758, in the middle far right, has at the bottom Ashana Hu, H-U, and Hu is not likely to be Hute Ludush in Shushinak. They're likely to maybe be a local, the name of a local ruler. We like to associate them with the bricks, but remember the bricks on the site were found in far distance from this building which maybe has a more administrative than religious function. Here's a drawing by Matthew Stoper of a seal ing on a tablet and a tablet, the copy of the tablet. These tablets record various kinds of metal, often for, and that includes gold, silver, and tin, and copper, mostly copper, and fairly large quantities. 
So whoever was operating in the Middle Elamite building was very interested in procuring and perhaps manufacturing of metal items. Many of them are listed as metal items for the, for the divinities, but there is clearly a commercial or clearly a, a larger kind of system involved in this. This is level three and this is level four. So I want to suggest that after level three, which dates between about 900 and 800 BC, we have only one burial that was found in the upper fill that might possibly date somewhat later in the Iron Age. We have no Achaemenid material. So if we compare Susa to Anshan, Susa was redone, rebuilt, and refurbished and likely expanded under the Achaemenids, while Anshan, the old center of Elamite power in the highlands, seems to have been, if not abandoned, a much lesser settlement than it had been in the past. Was it an urban settlement even in the late second millennium? I don't know. I don't think so, but there is always the possibility. One thing that we can say is that much of the material that was found in the Middle Elamite building is comparable, as you see here, to what we see in Susa. And in Susa in the late Middle Elamite phase. However, we have a number of other factors at play here. This is a map that shows some of those factors that are at play. One is a, a kind of, let's, let's say, um, division, if you will, of different ceramic groupings in the valley. Whereas Malian Anshan has large sort of presence of middle Elamite material, the surveys outside Malian have not produced that. They have Kale ware, they have Shoga ware, they have Tamaran ware. Sumner felt these different areas, different pockets of the Kur River Basin were a, an indication of people moving into the valley and settling down. I understand that there's new sort of evidence on this and I look forward to hearing about it in new excavated evidence from these and related sites. But from the point of view of Anshan, it ceases, I think, to be a real city around, say, 1600 when its population shrinks. And towards the end of the second millennium, it seems more or less an outpost connected, there is an outpost at least on the old city that was connected or linked to lowland Middle Elamite settlements. So I don't think it's a local center even at that point, but that's only speculation and I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts on it. And I think that I think that's my last slide and I will end it there. And I hope to take some of your questions in the, in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention.